I get a lot of questions about the yield curve and what is signaling for the future, the potential confounding actions of the Federal Reserve in terms of quantitative easing, and what the implications actually are. So let me talk about that uh, for a few minutes. So just a little bit of background. My dissertation at the University of Chicago in 1986 uh, discovered that there was a relation between the yield curve, which is defined in my dissertation as the yield on a U.S. 10-year treasury minus the yield on a three-month treasury bill, uh, that that yield curve had important information about future economic activity. In particular, my dissertation showed that in the recession since the 1960s, an inverted yield curve, which means that the long-term rate is below the short-term rate, and that's unusual, an inverted yield curve successfully forecasted all of the recessions up to my dissertation date. After the publication of my dissertation, uh, there were three inversions, and each one preceded a recession, including the global financial crisis. So that's seven for seven. So let's fast forward to um, June of 2019, and the yield curve inverted. And I went on the record saying that the model predicted a recession for 2020. Um, well, we're in a recession. Obviously, the model didn't take the COVID-19 into account. And we will never know the answer as to whether we would have gone into a recession without the COVID-19. However, I was not alone. So more than half of the CFOs at Duke University for, um, um, polls in their uh, CFO survey, and that's usually over 400 of them, over half believed that a recession would begin in 2020. And that number increased to 80% if you include the first part of 21. So again, we'll never know about that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we've got now eight out of eight. So uh, what about the signal today? So the yield curve is positively sloped, even though it's pretty flat. Um, does that forecast a recovery? And Potentially, is this confounded by uh, the QE or quantitative easing uh, strategies of the Fed? So, number one, the Fed has confounded the yield curve many times historically. Uh, indeed, this is a, not the first episode of QE. Uh, there's been many episodes uh, of QE. Indeed, I think that the Fed was actually more influential in 1960s and 70s when the size of the bond market was much smaller. Given the deficits that the U.S. government has been running, the bond market is so large that I really believe that the Fed has very limited control over uh, interest rates at the long maturity. They do have some influence on the short maturity. The inversion in 2019 was purely a long-term um, sort of action. So it was the long-term rate that went down as people started to move into what was perceived as the safe asset, the U.S. 10-year treasury. So when I say people, not just U.S., but all over the world, um, people fleeing to the safe haven. So again, um, I'm not that worried about um, these actions because we've seen them uh, before. However, let me qualify that uh, because the QE today is different than the QE in the global financial crisis. And we need to be careful about extrapolation from one crisis to the next. The QE that's been announced is unlimited. And I do worry about uh, the unlimited nature and we kind of go into no person's land where we don't really have any historical references. Let me give you uh, an example. I was very critical when the Fed uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis cut rates from 1.5% to 1%. I didn't think that was necessary. Rates were already low. And if you contrast this 
to September 2007. Um, the yield curve had been inverted for a year. And at the first part of the global financial crisis, the Fed cut. And they cut by 50 basis points. But the rate was 5.25%. So it was a pretty high rate that they cut from. So cutting from 1.5 to 1, just look, the rates were already low. And this is like really distortionary. And then they cut again, 100 basis points that take the rate to zero. So now that puts you into this weird situation where you've got these strongly negative real rates. Um, and the nominal rate, the U.S. Treasury even went negative. And then uh, we had a situation where people started to realize that, oh, well, the safe haven of the U.S. 10-year and U.S. 30-year uh, might not be so safe. So we had the 30-year bond drop below 1%. So who's going to buy that? Is that safe? Well, it's safe from default, but it's not safe from interest rate risk. So if rates went up by 1%, which is not unreasonable when there's so many money, um, so much money being printed, so if rates went up by 1%, that means you're going to take a hammering uh, if you're long that bond. You lose 20% of its value if it goes up by 1%. So then what you get is people leaving the long-term bond market and just buying like short-term um, like cash. So I don't mean physical cash, uh, I mean things like treasury bills. And then we saw that the rate on the bill actually uh, at some point went negative. So then, you know, the Fed uh, steps in because they see the possibility of the liquidity trap. So liquidity trap means that people just don't want uh, to hold uh, longer duration uh, bonds. So when that happens, then the rates uh, start to go up um, and, uh, and, and then the Fed actually, uh, intervenes as it has. So the Fed is intervening, keeping that long-term rate, uh, low, uh, because their buying kind of drives the price up, which we know drives the yields down. So yes, that is definitely distortionary. Uh, if they weren't in the market, uh, I think the rate, uh, would be higher, so we can actually do the thought experiment. Well, that means just a steeper yield curve. So I think that the yield curve is signaling a, um, a recovery. And I actually believe that we will have a recovery. This recession is a biological recession in that the cause was biological and the solution is biological. So on two dimensions, um, a vaccine would be a biological solution or some sort of pharmacological uh, solution, a drug a solution that basically reduces the mortality. So both of those are highly credible um, solutions that essentially uh, put an end to the cause uh, of this crisis, allows people uh, to go back to work. So just to be clear, um, in many recessions, the yield curve had returned to normal before the recession actually began. Okay, so think about that. So the idea is that the yield curve inversion gives an advanced signal. So it could be 12 to 18 months before the recession, you get the inversion. And if the recession's short, you might have uh, the yield curve return to normal before the recession actually begins or during uh, the recession. So to me, it's no surprise that the yield curve has a normal shape today. Yes, the signal has been compounded. I have no doubt uh, about that. But it's actually a lot easier to forecast the end of a recession than to forecast the beginning of a recession. And the reason is that recessions are relatively rare and they're short. So the average length of a recession might be a year and a half. So it's safe to say that um, these recessions are usually short. The global financial crisis was a longer uh, recession, but nevertheless, um, it, was, uh, it was less than three years. So, so I do believe that the signal is probably uh, an accurate signal from the model uh, today.